Hi and welcome to History Legends. This is an update about the situation in Ukraine. And if you have any updates, any new information, just comment it below. Before we cover the upcoming Russian offensive, we'll quickly summarize what happened in the past few days. And this video was recorded in the morning of February 28th, Eastern Time. By the way, one of my favorite YouTubers, bald and bankrupt, went to Kharkov at zero kilometers from the Russian border, allegedly the day before the Russian offensive. I'm you expect kind of tanks to be lined up, Vladimir Putin himself. But when you come here, you see it's just a field but just across there is russia wow he's crazy but we love him for his ballsiness so in the past few days russian forces have suffered high casualties we don't know exactly how many ukrainians claim 5300 killed wounded or prisoners while they themselves have not released any information about their own losses and just like during world war ii we should be highly skeptical of official casualty reports about enemy losses all we know is that about 200 Russians have been captured by Ukrainians and that around 500 to 600 Ukrainian armed forces personnel are in Russian custody. In the past few days, Russian forces have faced growing morale and logistic issues like the lack of food, fuel and ammunition. A brigadier has allegedly been captured. Another high-ranking commander has been killed. Ukrainians also launched deadly strikes on Russian columns using Turkish-made drones. Innumerable Russian columns have been ambushed by Ukrainian infantry armed with Javelin anti-tank missiles. Makes me wonder if tanks are still useful in the modern age, when this multi-million dollar high-tech equipment can easily get demolished by one or two guys armed with an ATMG. Like when cavalry charges of expensive mounted knights charged and got obliterated by peasants armed with arquebuses, a weapon that took only a few days to be trained with. But I do acknowledge that a lot of it has to do with overall doctrine and how the tanks were used in battle. From an operational level, it's true that Russian forces are tied down, and many cities that are contested or partially occupied have not been yet mopped up by Russian forces. And it seems it's because there's simply not enough Russian forces. As you can see, the situation is not good for Russia. Like military thinker Klozevitz said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. And this is exactly what happened to the Russians. But it's also a bit too early to say that Ukrainians have won. The Russian military has likely recognized that its initial expectations that limited Russian attacks would cause the collapse of Ukrainian resistance have completely failed and is recalibrating accordingly. The tide of the war could change rapidly in Russia's favor if the Russian military has correctly identified its failings and addresses them promptly, given the overwhelming advantage in net combat power Moscow enjoys. We will likely witness intense urban warfare in the coming days. From what I read, Russian forces have engaged the first echelon and a good part of their second wave, about 100,000 men, or 50% of the total forces that were lined up around the Ukrainian border. But there's a problem. Even American allies believe that although Ukrainian forces managed to delay and inflict losses on the Russian advance, they will likely be unable to halt further advance if the Kremlin commits additional reserves. In the past 24 hours, we saw Russian forces increase their use of firepower by bringing rocket launchers and artillery closer to the front to deal with stubborn enemy resistance. At the same time, they're taking the threat of the Ukrainian Air Force more seriously and claim to have mastery of the sky. This comes after a devastating raid of the Russian Air Force, and at this point of the conflict, it is unclear what the situation of the Ukrainian Air Force is and what type of anti-air capabilities they still have. In my previous video, I mentioned that Russia's plan was to wage a war like the Israelis during the Six Days War. But Israelis didn't face the same scale of terrain as the Russians do in Ukraine. Indeed, large distances take a lot of time to go through, especially when opposed by enemy forces. Let's have a quick look at historical data. During Operation Bagration, the Soviet advanced about 489 kilometers in less than a month. So an average of 18 kilometers a day at most. In comparison, the Crimean front advanced 175 kilometers in five days, or an average of 35 kilometers a day. Even for the push coming from Konotop, we're talking about 130 kilometers or 25 kilometers a day. And this takes into account 
the latest Russian tactical pause, which aimed to resupply and bring more men to the front, and basically solve the growing morale issue the Russian army faced. We can believe that the Russians are preparing something huge, and the Ukraine Defense Ministry announced that Russia has begun deploying more military reserve troops in and around Ukraine today. Overall, the Russian offensive is divided into a northern front trying to encircle Kiev, and a southern front trying to capture the most strategic cities and potentially encircle the Ukrainian Donbas army group. From an operation level, we can also notice how Russian forces have been halted by many urban areas, which Ukrainian forces are stubbornly defending, like Kiev, Kharkov, Somi, Chernihiv, and Kherson. And these tactical victories have indeed boosted the morale of the entire country. Even better, a lot of European countries have agreed to send a lot of military equipment to Ukraine. On the other hand, I feel that Russians have learned their lesson from Grozny and their campaign in Syria. Whenever they can, they will bypass trunk points and avoid getting bogged down. And this seems to be the case because they're advancing quickly into Ukrainian territory. In response, Ukrainian forces are forced into a constant fighting retreat, hoping they can contain as many Russian troops as possible and break their momentum. Just like a boxer, Russian forces are throwing one punch after another. Although many are blocked, they hope that one of them will eventually strike home and cause significant damage. Now, I don't know the situation of the Ukrainian army. There's very little information available. We don't know where the units are located, and what are their strength or losses. But I feel that the only Ukrainian plan right now is just hope that the boxer runs out of breath and gives up. I don't know if they have any mobile reserves left that could counterattack and inflict a devastating blow on the Russian army, a bit like the Polish did during the Battle of Warsaw in 1920. At the same time, Russians can't ignore major urban centers forever, and they seem to have brought a lot of reinforcements and firepower in three main regions. Kiev, Kharkov, and Mariupol. On the Kiev axis, Russian airborne and special forces troops are engaged in urban warfare in northwestern Kiev, but Russian mechanized forces are not yet in the capital. Russian forces conducted limited attacks on the direct approaches to Kiev on both banks of the Dnieper River, but have not penetrated into the city proper. Ukrainians also failed to eliminate this enemy vanguard right at the city gates which makes me question the actual Ukrainian forces in Kiev. With the information available, we can guess that Russian forces have conducted an operational pause on February 26, 7 and 28. Many important convoys have been heading towards Kiev. One of them was 100 vehicles strong. Many Chechens have also been spotted. They will most likely be used as shock troops. There are also some Russian National Guards units and allegedly even some Belarusian soldiers. All this points toward a major assault on Kiev soon. If residents in Kiev put up a heavy fight, Russian forces will have to use heavy force with armor and artillery to take the city. At the same time, Chechnya's Ramzan Kadyrov says Russia's tactics in Ukraine aren't working. It's time to start a large-scale operation in all directions. The tactics we've chosen in Ukraine are too sluggish. It's been going on for too long and it isn't effective. Kharkov and Kiev cannot be cleared with Tigers, Urals and UAZs. And this confirms that the Russians are changing strategy. More and more rocket launchers were spotted near the front line. I don't know the forces of the Ukrainian army in Kiev, but I hope they're prepared for what's about to come. Now, what I'm wondering is why it wasn't Kiev fortified before the invasion? But it doesn't seem that much has been done prior to the Russian attack. Why did they wait so long? At the same time, Russian forces are also trying to attack Kiev from the east from this road and this one. Some Russian vanguards seem to have reached Nijin, only 130 kilometers away from Kiev. It's still far enough from the capital, but close enough to add an extra layer of pressure on the Ukrainian eastern flank. Why are Ukrainian forces letting themselves get encircled in Kiev? Some people claim that Kiev will be the next Stalingrad and that the Russian army will get bucked down. But I hope they remember that at Stalingrad, it's the Russian reserves that flanked the German army that saved the city. And Stalingrad was never fully encircled. The fact that President Zelensky stays in the capital with all the civilians could be a public image battle. The world would not accept the full destruction of Kiev, the death of many civilians. Now let's talk about the Southern Front. 
In my opinion, the situation in Crimea is a disaster for Ukrainian armed forces. The eastern flank of the Crimean front, which has shown a massive breakthrough due to the lack of major urban centers. Now Mariupol, one of the most important nodes of the Ukrainian defense, is about to get encircled from three directions. And since Russian forces seem to prioritize movement along major roads, possibly to avoid problems with the upcoming Rasputitsa, we could expect an attack towards Zaporizhia. They're literally only 40 kilometers away. I have no clue what type of reserves the Ukrainian armed forces have in this area, but if Russian forces end up occupying Zaporizhia and Dnipro, they effectively cut off and trap all the Ukrainian forces in Donbass. If Ukrainian forces don't withdraw from the contact line immediately, they will face an unmitigated disaster. How do you expect to continue the fight to counterattack in Kiev if the bulk of your best troops is encircled. It's hard to say, but I recommend abandoning most of the eastern bank of the Dnieper and consolidate defenses of the river itself. And these choke points give a massive advantage to the defenders. Now, on the west flank, I'm not sure who holds Kherson, but I believe that the important Antonov Bridge and the city itself is still contested. But even then, the Russians have bypassed this choke point with a bridgehead that was set up at Nova Kahovka. And now Russian forces control some territory on the west bank of the Dnieper, including the city of Mykolaiv. From this position, Russians are a bit far from Kiev to intervene effectively. Instead, they could drive northeast along this road or even this one towards Dnipro. Easy to say, but it's still 300 kilometers to cover. Whereas they could simply aim for Odessa, which is 130 kilometers away. And this attack could be coupled with an amphibious landing. And I think Ukrainian forces there are preparing for a siege. Now the Kharkov Donbass region. The first Russian assault on Kharkov ended in a complete fiasco. Lightly armored units barely managed to advance inside the city. Many got ambushed in prepared Ukrainian defenses. Attacks were poorly coordinated and launched without any artillery preparation. It was very bad. And this is why Kadyrov got mad on Twitter. Only now are they starting to grind some outer parts of the city. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces have firmly positioned themselves on the Popedi Avenue in northwest Kharkov. Currently, Kharkov is like a thorn in the foot of the Russians. It's painful and it's the key to all of eastern Ukraine. All I know is that the Ukrainian units positioned there are among the most elite and best equipped ones. And it shows. They launch many counterattacks, quick and effective. They're doing great. The problem is south of their position. The constant grind on the forces on the Donbass contact line keeps a lot of Ukrainian forces fixated there. The line is also being flanked from the north through Luhansk, plus the attack on Mariupol that we mentioned, that was coupled with an amphibious landing of 2,000 Russian marines. At this rate, Mariupol could fall any day. If that happens, the Russians will be in a perfect position to create a cauldron. I repeat, Ukrainian forces have to withdraw immediately and defend Zaporozhye and Dnipro at all costs, or the situation might get very bad. Conclusion! The offensive did not go as planned for the Russians, but before calling it quits, Putin will most likely try a major push in the coming days, most likely towards Kiev to complete his objective of a regime change. The longer the conflict drags on, the better it is for Ukrainians. Russian morale will drop, Ukrainians are also expecting large shipments of weapons from Europe, as well as the arrival of foreign volunteers. The only question I have now is, can Ukraine continue the fight if Kiev falls? That's all I have for you. I'll make another update in a few days. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I thank all my patrons for sponsoring this video.